I'm going to jump into our panel discussion and uh, on, on a topic that's, that's really close to my heart, which is innovation and uh, sustainability. Uh, so, uh, sorry, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Priya Chiba. Uh, I am from Google. I'm a program manager and uh, work in the advanced tech and innovation uh, group. Uh, with me, I have Julius Kusuma from Meta and Robert Bunger from Schneider Electric. And I'm going to let Julius introduce himself. Julius? Uh, thank you, Priya, and thank you, everybody, for attending this panel. Um, I'm a research scientist. I work for Meta, and I work on sustainability solutions for data centers. OK. Uh, <clears throat> Rob Bunger from, uh, no, oh, there we go. OK. <laughs> Rob Bunger from uh, Schneider Electric. I work at the CTO office of our Secure Power Division. Um, I was involved, it uh, feels like many years ago, with the data center facility group when there were zero sub-projects. And uh, we had a room about a quarter of this size and a lot fewer people. So it's really actually exciting to see this many people, even though it's the third day in the afternoon. So. That's great. Well, thank you both for being here. And really appreciate you joining me on the, on the panel. So um, today, we've got a few topics we wanted to cover. And I talked about metrics, and I talked about innovation. So I think the first thing, um, and this is going to go to Robert, is metrics. So Robert, you presented a really great paper at the, uh, the Tech Talk series we had early on this year. And I wanted you to just highlight the key point of that, that paper on metrics that you presented yeah. before we dive into some of these questions. Yeah, so in, uh, in 2021, we, we actually uh, got together a, a group uh, within Schneider to, to look at specifically metrics for sustainability. Um, as everybody knows, PUE has been the main metric, and, and uh, although people will, will point out its flaws, it's done a great job over the past 10 years to really improve um, <laughs> you know, uh, the, the facility and its energy use. Um, but what, you know, there's a lot more to sustainability. So we kind of broke things out into five categories of energy, uh, carbon, water, uh, waste, and land and biodiversity, and, and, and came up with you know, 23 metrics we think uh, apply well. And the, and the trick with this whole thing is when we first looked at the laundry list, I mean, there is a ton of stuff you can track. Um, but one, you have to actually be able to measure it to make a difference, and you actually have to be able to communicate it. There's a lot of these measures out there, you know, you try to describe it to non-experts and they don't know what it means. So, um, uh, you know, so, you know, we're hoping that that could be a good starting point of a discussion uh, around uh, a framework. Sounds good. Um, so, so what would you say, um, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll ask Julius this question, what do you, would you say are the main metrics we should be focusing on Julius, is it PUE, WE, um, you know, and, and how should we be focusing on it? Yeah, I agree PUE and WE are really important metrics today. Um, in Meta, we pursue additional metrics based on the LEED certification. So that includes things like uh, indoor air quality, how to deal with waste and how to treat them well before we uh, get rid of them. Um, I think those are really good starting points. And I want to actually bring this to, uh, to uh, what Rob had said yesterday, which is that embodied carbon it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. We're building lots and lots of data centers. Um, embedded carbon is uh, becoming like a significant factor for us and for the world. And you know, like, maybe let's talk about that too also. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's a good segue into scope three and embodied carbon. And Robert, you gave a great prezzo yesterday on scope three. Yeah. Um, you talked about IT and our compute being the largest contributor, but I want you to now focus on the facility side. Right. Right. So, so on the facility side, what should we be looking at to decarbonize our facility? Like, what are the largest contributors from your perspective, and how should we be focusing or focusing our efforts? Yeah. So, the thing that kind of comes out when you start to study it is first things that get replaced often, right? So that don't last a long time, because uh, if you look at a 15 and 20 year life of a data center, so. Like the VRLA batteries are a good example that, you know, maybe four or five years to replace those. And so every time you're taking a carbon hit. So that's one thing to look at. The other thing is, is as we were looking at it, you know, you're so used to putting things in some kind of ratio to understand its impact, uh, you know, like uh, dollars per watt for cost of a data center or PUE or, you know, so what is, 
the carbon per megawatt of a data center. And that's actually a little bit hard because it's, uh, it's, we found it's is not as correlated with, there is correlation, but that, but versus weight. So if you kind of now start getting your mindset into, you know, how dense things are, then that'll start leading you to where the, the, the biggest carbon impact is from an embodied carbon perspective. Yeah, another one that's uh, quite significant is the, uh, in the building itself. Yeah. Um, which is really, really important, not only for data center, but also for the world. Um, as you saw, as you were coming in and out of this building, it's full of concrete. Um, concrete is a major contributor to uh, uh, man-made carbon emissions. It's yeah. actually 8% um, yeah. globally. And it's also a big deal for data centers. Yeah. So it turns out that um, when we add sustainability as a metric to optimize in concrete, there's a lot that you can innovate with. So for example, uh, concrete at its essence is cement, water, and many different kinds of aggregates. It's a high dimensional optimization problem, which we know it's really, really difficult for humans to be able to do. And so one of the things that we have been exploring is the use of AI to optimize concrete ingredients. And what we found is that AI does a very good job in understanding the space of possible um, ingredients list, let's say compositions, that experts can then refine. And we recently tested this in our data center in the mm -hmm. Kelb. Uh, successfully, we were able to reduce the carbon footprint of the concrete by about 40%. Um, this is exciting, but this is just the beginning. Um, every location is unique. Availability of material is a challenge, as you know these days. Yes. And turning uh, a list of ingredients into formulas, if we're into cooking, is not quite a recipe yet. And there's a lot more uh, work that needs to be done to scale this innovation. But this is a good beginning, I think, for realizing that even something that is as basic as just concrete, there's a lot of innovation that we can do together. So, so that's a really interesting topic, using AI to figure out your optimum concrete mix. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about it and, and how you went about, like, you know, does, does the AI account for recyclability or recycled materials? Yeah. You know, can great, you, can great you describe question. that a little bit? We're looking at a, a carbon reduction in construction holistically. And so this actually starts not from AI, but this actually starts from, can we just simply reduce what we need to do construction with? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of design and redesign and optimization, both in the uh, drawings and in the construction stage also, to be able to do this. And then the second one is about the choice of the materials that we would like to use for the different elements of the data center. So this covers many things. Um, concrete is one of the elements. Um, I believe later on we're going to be a talk about using novel ingredients, which also ties together very nicely. And then the last one is what do we do with the waste material? So there's a big, uh, big uh, uh, set of things that needs to be done. Uh, when it comes to concrete, uh, sustainability is one. Strength is definitely the key requirement for concrete, but speed of deployment, availability of materials, and how we source them are also really, really important. So we like to think that we've done a successful pilot, but to scale, we need collaboration. And this is where I, OCP as a community has an opportunity to lead in the space and actually work together with the construction industry to help decarbonize the world. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, collaboration is really important in the space because, you know, we, we, you know, we, we, we're talking about concrete, but yesterday when you and I were talking, we, we are not the largest purchaser of concrete in the world, right? Well said. There's well said. other industries that purchase concrete. So, so we definitely need to collaborate across industries in order to get where we need to be from a embodied carbon perspective in our construction. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, so you know, why is scope three such a big deal? Because, you know, we, we buy electricity, which is our scope two. Um, and then scope one is our diesel generators on site that provide backup. Why should we be focusing on scope three? I think one element that is often overlooked is that the impact of scope three is immediate. As soon as you buy it, as soon as you build the data center, you get the impact. And it lasts a long time. And right? it lasts a very long time, exactly. <laughs> and when it talks about power, maybe we could rely on the grid decarbonizing itself and leveraging that. With data centers, the time to do something is now. We cannot wait. Yeah. Robert, what are your thoughts regarding that? <clears throat> right. Uh, you know, the, uh, you know, I, I, you know, for sure we are able to do, um, uh, you know, power purchase agreements to do, you know, renewable, you know, there's still, you know, for scope two, they're still like looking just at the local grid, but there is an opportunity. So I don't say this is off topic, but to look at the, uh, the operation of the facility to allow it to 
uh, we call it help green up, right? I, I think you had on your list, uh, you, know, uh, you know, microgrids, grid interactive, and so those type of capabilities will actually help the local grid become more, add more renewables oh. and be greener for actually everybody. Um, but like you said, uh, the impact of, of uh, scope three is, is immediate. Uh, you don't amortize it like, uh, you know, like financial, uh, you know, things. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, in the circular economy, uh, you know, the, the word durable, how durable is it, uh, how repairable is it, and how recyclable is it? And so all the, you know, thinking those simple terms will also help reduce scope three impact. Yeah, and you know, one other thought is, as we decarbonize our scope two uh, resources and um, decarbonize scope one, um, Scope three is naturally going to become the larger proportion yes. Yes. Of, of our emissions. So I think, you know, that's another reason we should be focusing on scope three. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So let's talk about innovation uh, within the sustainability space. And Julie, uh, Julius, you mentioned a few things earlier <coughs> on, but, you know, how do you see uh, innovation and sustainability, like crossing Hats and how do you think we should be leveraging innovation within the space apart from the AI you mentioned earlier? Data center facilities is what allows IT hardware to operate safely and efficiently within its operating envelope in spite of what the environment is going through. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a lot of opportunities in being able to understand uh, for different configurations and designs and conditions how do we optimize between the different metrics, between utilization, the amount of compute that you do, power, water, and so on and so forth. Um, one recent work that my colleagues did is they built a, uh, a, a way, a thermodynamic model of data centers, which I think is really important because um, now we're dealing with more um, with uh, building data centers and operating them in different locations, in different weather, and with climate change happening and more climate disasters um, challenging the way that we build and operate things. So for example, as you recall, um, last year in February, there was a massive um, storm, winter storm in Texas where temperature went down from 60 degrees Fahrenheit to zero Fahrenheit in 10 days. That was clearly a major challenge for us. That got us thinking, what if we, could, we had a way to be able to predict those things and be able to simulate those things efficiently so that we can not only operate better, maybe we can design better and we can make better decisions in, being, in what, how we do our data center design. So I think there's a lot of space to really innovate in this, and OCP is a really good place to be able to do these kinds of things. Okay, yeah. Yeah, uh, to add on, you know, I, I sometimes give a very simple example. I mean, I remember the days, so economization, great, that's a great energy efficiency thing. And I remember the days for cooling economization where it was, you know, uh, a, it's October 15th, it's time to turn on the economization and you go turn the valve so it goes through the, uh, Economization, right? So it was a very, a very binary thing. Okay, and then when it hits March, you know, you know, you maybe turn it off. Okay, we're better than that right now. We have, but you know, imagine in the future where you can actually optimize hour by hour, minute by minute, because you have smart systems and AI figuring that out. Um, and even think about uh, WUE now using water for evaporative cooling is great from an energy perspective, but not from a water perspective. And I think we all wanna to drive towards zero water use. But, but you, know, you could imagine where uh, you know, there's gonna be transitory dry periods. It might be dry, you might be very wet. Well, if, it's, if it happens to be a wet period and there's plenty of water, maybe you can save a little bit of elect, you know, electricity and this can be automated. So there's just, I think, tons of opportunity for automation, uh, working smarter to improve sustainability. Yeah, that, that's a good that's a good point, and and I think having that predictive knowledge yes. is going to be important because you know as you said, yeah, if there's a lot of rain, there's enough water to you, that you can use. Absolutely. So how do you you know how do you look at the picture holistically and come up with a solution? And that's where technology definitely comes in into play. Yeah. So yeah, this is really exciting. Um, I think you know. Within the sustainability space in DCF, I think we can definitely work together, uh, garner some support from the audience here. But let's open up the, the floor to the audience and see if there's any questions and discussion, open discussion we can have. Any questions?
Sorry, I'll be the guy that asks the dumb question. Why is embodied carbon a problem? Isn't disembodied carbon a bigger problem? So uh, oh. carbon's only a problem when it gets into the atmosphere. Wouldn't we really ah. be trying to embody as much carbon okay. as possible? <laughs> Good. <laughs> I guess poor choice of words when we talk about scope three, I guess. That's yes. right. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so embodied carbon refers to all the carbon that was released into the atmosphere when a product was manufactured from uh, cradle to um, install. Great. Uh, yeah, install. Yeah, install. Right. install. For, yeah. Yeah. So, so you know, <laughs> if something had to be mined, <laughs> yes. then and, and you know, it's and it had to be transported. It had to be manufactured. You count up all that carbon contribution, and that becomes the embodied carbon yeah. of the component. associated with the physical thing that you have. But it was released. Yeah. Okay. So during the concrete manufacturing, that's what's that's what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. 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 Cool. That's right. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, it's yeah. not a dumb question. It's a really good question. Yeah, it is. I'm sure people, there's people other talking questions. about using low carbon steel for the same reason, like that. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. yes. Because they use exactly. fossil yes. fuels to get to the high temperatures they need to. To make carbon high carbon content steel. Yes. Thanks for that. That's right, yes. So when you're considering reducing uh, scope three emissions, are you balancing that against, say, energy efficiency or renewable power purchases that could uh, maybe be a more effective use of the money that you're spending on the data center? You know what I'm saying? Which, which, is, which is more effective, yeah. to use better concrete or to buy some solar panels? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, for Meta, we've made a commitment to be net zero by 2030. So in a way, like we have to look at all the factors that cause us carbon impact, let's say, scopes one, two, three, and then we have to be able to um, drive them down to zero or get offsets against yeah. them. Yeah, but it's a good point, right? We don't have infinite resources and we cannot work on everything at the same time. So, yeah, because how do you prioritize those to make the biggest impact at first? Yeah, this is definitely like a big consideration, especially when you look at new designs and different materials, you know, between concrete and what if you build it from um, laminated timber, for example, which I believe is one of the talks coming up after this one. Um, we are looking at all the options, you know, like I mentioned earlier, we're looking at this really holistically. We understand that there are premiums associated with this and, you know, we're, hopefully we can manage the premiums and pick the best ones. Yeah, I, I, it's probably not your job, but I mean, for instance, Google has, has, has said that they're gonna buy more renewable power in the areas where their data centers are, because you know, power is pretty fungible, so if you, if you buy you know, renewable power and a lot of people don't care, then it doesn't really change the power mix in your neighborhood. Yes, typically those agreements are insists on what is called additivity. So you're not just swapping somebody else's carbon emission for yours, but rather you have to agree to expand the renewable capacity to be able to overcome what you are going to be consuming. That's right. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, good questions, thank yeah. you. Yeah. My question is about aligning priorities, uh, particularly for you, Robert. Uh, you, you work for a very large company for which um, <clears throat> the whole data center industry is just a small part of your customer base. You know, it's, Huge, huge industry, um, and I'm wondering what, I mean, as you said, you have limited resources. How do you, how does, how does Schneider prioritize sustainability efforts uh, in, into which we're, we're, you know, this whole discussion is, is, is interlocking? But what's the, from Schneider's point of view, what's the path forward? Yeah, you're you're putting me on the spot to to be able to recall the, uh, you know, the, uh, <laughs> the the net zero goals that we have set publicly. Um, but they, uh, they, do, they do start off with net zero in operations, uh, right? And then, you know, definitely our, our own scope three is a little bit further down the line. So we have the, you know, 2015, 2030, and we just signed up for the, uh, you know, science-based target initiative, um, which has a little more specific type of things, you know, with limited use of offsets. So, you know, it's a challenge, uh, you know, for any company. And, and I, we were talking that, uh, you know, my worry for the industry is, is that there is, uh, you know, limited resources of experts to be able to pull off the understanding of scope three, scope two, for everybody who wants to do it at the same time. But, um, 
you know, the fact that all industries are, are, are talking about it and doing it is, is encouraging. So I think I gave you a non-answer. <laughs> but, but it's uh, operational first for us, you know, carbon, and then looking at, up, you know, upstream uh, scope three and then downstream scope three. Yeah. Uh, I've been involved in uh, lead certifications. Is enough done there? I mean, there are, you get points for the way you source your construction products and things like that. Is there enough done being done there or should more be done to tie a lead certification to scope three? Yeah, that's a good question. I think there's more should be done, I think, because um, especially in the view of us having the goal to be net zero, then lead will set threshold, but the threshold does not really go down to zero. So I think that the minimum, that's the gap that needs to be addressed. It's a great question. Hi, Brandon. So with a lot of the materials we're talking about, um, many of these are, they come out of very heavily industrialized uh, manufacturing processes, mining processes, things like that. And many of these are very capital intensive. They take a long time to overhaul. They're very commodified industries. So they're very slow to change or very cautious and very conservative. So we're gonna keep dealing with the things that we control directly and as we keep needing to work this down, at some point we need to work directly with those parts of the economy. Are you aware of any conversations happening in your organization's st strategy level conversations of how to work more directly upstream at the uh, mining level and at the, uh, the, the primary um, processing stage? Yeah, so uh, those conversations are happening, uh, and it's not just within our industries. Like, I was talking to multiple vendors at this conference as well, and several of them have said that, yes, they are talking to the steel industries and have secured uh, low-carbon steel, so they're actually using hydrogen as the fuel to manufacture their steel. So those conversations are happening or starting to happen. Uh, the the key is like, you know, how willing are those industries uh, going to be to transition their operations to uh, better fuels that, that are low carbon emitting, right? Um, there are organizations like iMasons that are, ha have direct contact with the, uh, with the concrete industry and the steel industry and um, what we have people from DCF or from, from our sustainability group that are within iMasons too. So what we wanna do is make sure that we have that cross collaboration within other industry groups that are dealing directly with those industries as well. I hope that answers your Thanks question. Thanks a lot. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to ask you about net zero. So obviously, you know, we want the carbon, the carbon that you're going to be emitting. So we need to measure scope one, two, and three. How do we get, how do you then account for the carbon that you're offsetting from that? Biological sequestration, geological sequestration, how are you gonna measure that to say you are net zero truly? And, yeah. and to help you with that maybe, should we be, should this industry be talking about scope four emissions, avoided emissions by some, of, by digitalization? That's a, that's a good comment. Um, I didn't realize that there was a scope for avoided emissions, but avoided emissions is something that I think we all are looking at because we all want to avoid emissions. But how does that count and contribute? I think that's still to be determined. Yeah, uh, when it comes to offsets, um, there are certification bodies that we rely on. You know, it's quite a bit outside of the scope of what I'm informed about. So, you know, happy to touch base offline to discuss some of this. Yeah. Okay, but, yeah. but of course, you mean you're, you're the measuring the, what you're measuring in scope one, two, and three. You have a value, but how do you going to how are we going to prove that uh, that value is offset by sequestration, taking carbon out of? Or are you just going to rely on the fact that everything is going to be zero carbon? That's my point, which is not. Um, so net zero is a real problem because <coughs> you need to yeah. measure both sides of the equation. Uh, yeah. I with regards to avoid it, I know, and, and, and again, I'm not very, very close to this. I know as we, you know, us as manufacturer of stuff, 
right? And things that use energy downstream, you know, we, we look at how much can be avoided from a typical operation. So improved efficiency of equipment and things like that. So there is a bit of avoided claim that we have based on, you know, uh, the standards out there. Um, but yeah, I, you know, uh, uh, sequestration and stuff is, is on the radar, uh, but, you know, I think we're at the stage right now where we just have to get the scope three just needle moving down. That's right. Well, thank you all. Appreciate you participating and the questions. Thank you very much.